Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, welcome. welcome. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Yang Song, so Frankfurt, to tell us tell us about the score based genetic model, genetic models, fusion genetic models, which has been uh, increasingly popular in recent days. Uh, uh, so for example, some of it has to be the latest. Uh, door E or E two more on OpenAI that they also that they also use this model. Let me introduce a bit more about Yang. So um, he's currently a final year final year PhD at Stanford University University, and his research interest is uh, in deep journey models and their applications to influence solving and AI and AI safety. So um, his all uh, papers in this line of work has been recognized with with a outstanding paper at last year's uh, uh, iClear. And also an oral presentation in Near East 2019. Um, he is also a GCP recipient of the Apple uh, PhD Fellowship in AI and AI Machine, and also the JP Morgan the PhD Fellowship. Okay, so uh, back, back to you. So you, so we are very excited to hear about your to hear about your talk. Yeah, thanks, Injun, for the introduction. I saw a message in chat saying that the audio quality is quite bad. I wonder whether it is uh, true for me as well. Uh, is it fine? It's fine. Hey. So I can hear you clearly. Okay, sure. Sounds good. Yes, I'm very excited today to share with you my research on uh, a new method to generate data. And I will show you some quite exciting uh, results that shows that we can rival the performance scans in some applications like image generation. So uh, in the past few years, we have witnessed a lot of progress in the field of machine learning. We have uh, so much progress in many applications such as autonomous driving, speech recognition, machine translation, recommendation systems, and many others. So in almost all those applications, we follow the same machine learning pipeline. And in this pipeline, we first uh, have access to a physical world and we need human efforts to collect data from the world, followed by data pre-processing and cleaning. And then give, this gives us a curated data set. We then fit this data set to machine learning algorithms to train an, an algorithm to perform a certain task. So in this pipeline, data has become indispensable for the success of machine learning. And we need high quality data sets for 20 many different things. For example, we need a high quality image data set, such as ImageNet, to train an accurate model for image recognition. We need high quality text data set like Glue to train models for natural language understanding. And there are many other examples in other applications of machine learning. However, this data collection procedure is laborious in most cases. And what's worse, it has to be repeated every time we want to obtain data on the new settings. So one research question I'm interested in is, suppose we have collected some data, can we leverage those existing data to simulate the data generating process in order to obtain data on the new settings or with new constraints? So equivalently, can we build a data simulator? A data simulator is a machine that can generate an infinite number of data points. And if this data simulator captures the essence of the data generation process, you should be able to generate new data points under slightly different new settings. And also just like some simulators in other fields, we hope to provide potential data points to this data simulator and query the probability values that those data points could have be generated from this data simulator. So those data simulators actually have been studied with a long history in statistics and in machine learning. In statistics, they are known as statistical models. And in machine learning, they are known as generative models. So because I work in machine learning, I will refer to such data simulators as generative models from now on. And because we use deep neural networks, I will use this simple neural network to represent those generative models. So why do we need those generative models? Because they have so many important applications in the real world. Suppose we have a generative model that captures the image generation process then we should be able to use it to convert a stroke page into a photorealistic image that preserves the semantics. And here there are two images on the right hand side you can see, and those images were actually generated by a real method that I'm going to talk about in today's presentation. So given a genetic model on paintings, we may also use it to convert text description into high quality artwork that matches this text description. 
And genetic models can also help us solve challenging inverse problems, such as those in medical image reconstruction. Suppose we have a genetic model on medical images. We may use it to convert machine scannings of human bodies into medical images that are consistent with those machine measurements. In computer tomography, for example, we can use a genetic model trained on typical CT images to provide prior knowledge. And this prior knowledge can significantly reduce the number of X-ray projections for patients. And this can reduce radiation, of course. And with a genetic model on images of a traffic signs, we may also use the probability values from those models to detect potential outliers. For a typical traffic sign image, a good genetic model will assign higher probability to such images. But for a suspicious traffic sign image, someone might have tempered with the traffic sign to cause confusion. And a good genetic model will assign lower probability to such images because those images, they appear very infrequently in the real world. So those probability values can quantify the frequency of those uh, images, the typicality of those images, and they can be used for detecting uh, outliers. And of course, genetic models are not restricted to image modeling. The same principle can be applied to basically every other possible data modality. And one example is uh, we nowadays use genetic models to convert uh, text to audio signals, convert text to speech. And we can also use genetic models to convert documentation to source code. And this can greatly improve the productivity of computer programmers. So now we know genetic models are so powerful. The question is how can we build such powerful genetic models? It turns out that we can do this by estimating the probability distribution of data. So suppose we have collected a large training data set as a toy example, this is a data set of uh, images of dogs. So in statistics and machine learning, we can typically assume that there exists an unknown probability distribution called the data distribution that has generated every single data point in the data set. And if we can find another probability distribution as our model to approximate our unknown data distribution in some way, then we can use this model distribution for many different applications. For example, we can generate an unlimited number of novel data points just by sampling from our model distribution. And we can also compute the probability values for any potential data point. For a relevant uh, data point like this picture of a chihuahua, we will assign a higher probability. But for a relatively irrelevant uh, data point like this picture of a muffin, we will assign lower probability because those images are outside of the data distribution. So this model distribution can generate novel data points. It can also give us probability evaluation. So it is actually a good genetic model. The biggest challenge here is uh, our data distribution, however, can be extremely complicated in the real world, especially for high dimensional data like uh, images or uh, audio. And as a result, we need to find a very complex probability distribution as our model to fit our complex data distribution. So how can we find such a complex model distribution? Recall that in statistics, we work a lot with those tractable simple distributions such as a Gaussian distribution. A Gaussian distribution is fully tractable, but unfortunately it is too simple to fit to complex data distributions. And in fact, a Gaussian distribution can be represented as a computational graph of two layers, where the first layer corresponds to the input. Second layer is basically a single unit that gives us the probability density function of the input. So here, mu denotes the mean of this Gaussian, and d denotes the dimensionality of x. To build a more complex model distribution, we, of course, need a bigger and also deeper computational graph, and is a deep neural network. Uh, here, we hope to use a deep neural network to represent a probability distribution P theta, where theta den denotes the weights in this deep neural network. And when we use deep neural networks to build genetic models, we get deep genetic models. Unfortunately, it is now trivial to use a deep neural network to directly represent a probability distribution. So this is because a deep neural network is basically a function that converts a high dimensional input to a typically one dimensional output, which we denote as F data. So this value F data does not directly represent a distribution, 
because it may not even be positive everywhere. So to construct a distribution from this deep neural network, we typically need to first take the exponential of the output to make it positive. And then we can normalize the output by dividing by a constant z theta in order to construct a probability distribution that is positive everywhere is properly normalized and properly defined. So here, the denominator z theta is known as the normalizing constant or partition function. So this normalizing constant is given by computing the high dimensional integral of the exponential function of f theta for all possible values of x. For Gaussians, this normalizing constant is fully tractable because f theta has a special functional form that allows us to compute the integral in a closed form. But Gaussians are definitely too restrictive. And once we move from Gaussians to deep neural networks, you can see that this normalizing constant is typically intractable to compute for the most general families uh, of neural networks. And in fact, even in the simplified case where x is discrete and this integral becomes a summation, computing this normalizing constant is a still a sharp peak complete problem, which is at least as hard as MT complete. And this says that this normalizing constant is uh, one of the fundamental challenges of deep genetic modeling. And actually, it is also an important challenge in some other relevant fields, such as thermodynamics and uh, statistical mechanics. The question is how does the current literature, how does the current research community address this difficulty of the intractable normalizing constant? There are many three approaches. The first approach is that we can approximate this normalizing constant with approaches like uh, variational inference or Markov chain Monte Carlo. So here are some examples. The cost is uh, once we approximate this normalizing constant, we lose the ability to compute probability values accurately because those probabilities are given by dividing by the approximate normalizing constant. So the second major approach is we can use restricted neural network models to make sure that our normalizing constant is tractable by construction. So here are some examples. The cost is once we restrict our neural network models, we also limit the flexibility of models we can use for building our deep genetic models. And the final approach is to use generative adversarial networks or GANs. So GANs can uh, completely bypass this intractable normalizing constant problem because they model the data generating process directly, not the underlying probability distribution. However, because GANs are not probabilistic, they cannot compute probability values easily. So those are some of the existing challenges of deep genetic modeling. How can we address all those challenges? If we want to build a better framework of genetic modeling, then what would be needed? So the first thing we want to harm is we hope to allow very flexible models. So this addresses the second difficulty. And this also helps us take full advantage of the deep learning revolution. This can uh, allow us to build very flexible deep neural networks to build very powerful genetic models. And the second desideratum is we hope to allow accurate probability evaluation. So this can address the rest of difficulties. And those accurate probability values can be very useful in outlier detection, in model compa comparison. They're also critical in lossless compression according to the standard theory of uh, uh, our coding theory and information theory. So finally, towards a better framework of genetic modeling, we of course want to generate data with better quality. So in the meanwhile, we also hope to control this data generation process in a flexible way so that this might be used for many other important applications such as those in medical image reconstruction. And in this talk, I will show you one such framework that satisfies all three desiderata. The key of this framework is to work with score functions to represent probability distributions. So what are score functions? Suppose we have a continuous probability distribution, in which case Px is known as the probability density function. We can define the Stein score function as the gradient of a log Px. So be careful the gradient is taken with respect to x, not with respect to model parameters. So this quantity is also called score function or scores for brevity. So what does a score function look like? So here is a figure that shows the density function and the score function for a mixture of Gaussian distribution. 
The density function is a color coded where darker color means a higher density. So the density function, uh, so the score function is a vector field of gradients that points to directions where the density function uh, has the fast, fastest growth. So given the density function, we can compute the score function by taking derivatives. And conversely, once we have the score function, we can also recover the density function by computing integrals. So mathematically, this score function preserves all the information in the original probability density function. Uh, but computationally, uh, we have a lot of advantages. So by working with those score functions, we can build a new framework of genetic modeling, which we term score-based genetic modeling. So this framework satisfies all three density data that we listed before. So first, it allows very flexible models because score functions can bypass this intractable normalizing constant completely, uh, as I will dis discuss right after. And we can use very flexible deep neural networks to model those score functions. And then we can learn those neural networks from data with principled statistical methods. And I will also show you that we can generate new data samples by directly sampling from our models of our score functions. And moreover, we can have a very high quality new samples that can be comparable to GANs in many applications. And this sampling procedure can also become controllable to allow us to solve many challenging u post inverse problems of those in medical image reconstruction. And finally, I will show you that it is possible to compute accurate probability values using those models of our score functions, and we can demonstrate better empirical performance. So now, uh, as the next part, I will first focus on how score-based genetic modeling allows us to use very flexible models. To recall that one of the major difficulty in deep genetic modeling is due to our intractable normalizing constant. So when we try to model a probability distribution directly, then no matter how we change the model parameters or architectures, they always have to, have to be normalized, meaning that the area below the curve has to be one. So this means if we want to use a deep neural network to model this probability distribution, we have to worry about this intractable normalizing constant issue. But in contrast, if we use the score function to represent this probability distribution, then as this animation indicates, there is no such normalization restriction at all. And in fact, if we compute the score function for the deep neural network model on the left-hand side, you can see that the score function is just the difference between two terms, where the only term that depends on this intractable normalizing constant is always a zero because the gradient of a constant is always zero. And as a result, the score function is the same as the gradient of this neural network. And this gradient can be computed easily using automatic differentiation or with bank propagation. So from now on, I will use F theta to denote this deep neural network model for our score function. And I will call it a score model. So suppose we have collected a large training data set. Here, each point represents one data instance. We may use x1, x2 to xn to denote every data point in this data set. And we can use p data to denote the un unknown data distribution that we hope to estimate. So with traditional statistical approaches, we can use maximum likelihood estimation to train a properly normalized statistical model p theta to approximate p data. The question is, can we do the same thing for score models? Can we train the score function to estimate the unknown score function of the data distribution? So mathematically, the problem is described as below. We have a data set and every data point was ID sampled from this unknown data distribution. Our goal is to estimate the score function for the data distribution. And we have a score model. This is a vector valued neural network that maps a d-dimensional input to a d-dimensional output. And we hope to uh, optimize this score model such that it is close to the unknown score function of our data distribution. So how can we train our score model? We need to minimize an objective function which compares two vector fields of score functions where one vector field is uh, uh, ground truth score function for our data distribution. And the other vector field is given by our score model. So how can we compare their difference? 
let's imagine we can overlap them with each other, then we can compute the difference vectors between those pairs of uh, vector fields. And then we can average over the lenses of those different vectors to form a single scalar objective to quantify the difference between those two vector fields. So mathematically, this intuition can be captured by the Fisher divergence objective function. So Fisher divergence is essentially the expected squared Euclidean distance between the data score and the model score averaged over samples from the data distribution. However, this feature divergence cannot be directly computed because we don't know the ground truth value of the score function for our data distribution. But luckily, there exists an old method called score matching that uses integration by parts to convert our feature divergence into the following equivalent objective. And in the equivalent objective, there is no such dependency on the data score function. And the expectation in our score matching loss function can always be estimated using the empirical mean over the training data set. So this score matching idea is quite smart, but unfortunately it's not very frequently used in practice. This is because the score matching objective has a critical computational challenge. That is, we have to compute the choice of the Jacobian of our score model. And when X has a lot of dimensions, this Jacobian matrix will become a huge matrix and computing the trace will involve a large number of bank propagation. So it's not a scalable approach. So in our research, we hope to address this difficulty by leveraging the idea of random projections. So the intuition is uh, follow, as follows. Suppose we have two high dimensional vector fields that are close to each other. We may project them along random directions to get random one dimensional uh, scalar fields. So those scalar fields will also be close to each other if the original vector fields are close to each other. So this random projection can actually reduce the dimensionality of the problem to one. And based on this intuition, we developed a method called sliced score matching. So it is a computationally more efficient variant of a score matching, where the cost of computing the objective of score, sliced score matching is comparable to the cost of evaluating the output of the score model. So it's quite efficient. And we have additionally proved the consistency and asymptotic normality properties of slice score matching, meaning that this is a principled statistical approach. For detailed algorithm and proofs, I don't have time to cover here, but if you're interested, please feel free to read our papers. So now I'm gonna show you that score-based genetic modeling can allow very flexible models because the score function bypasses this normalizing constant. And as a result, we can use very flexible deep neural networks called score models to model our score function. And we can learn them from data using principled statistical methods like score matching. For the next part, I will talk about how we can generate samples from those score models. And then moreover, how can we obtain uh, high quality samples that can be comparable or better than guns and how we can control this sample generation procedure for important applications in inverse problem solving. So we know that given a large data set, we can use methods like score matching to train our score model to estimate the score function of the data distribution. The next step towards building a genetic model is to find an approach to create samples directly from a given score function. So how can we do this? Suppose we are given a score function and let's imagine that many random initial points scattered across the space. Can we move those random points to form samples from the score function? Well, one idea is we can move those points along the directions given by the score function so that those points have higher and higher probability values. But this won't work in practice because all the points will collapse into each other. Luckily, we can address this collection issue by injecting the right amount of Gaussian noise into the same procedure. So this method of moving data points by following the noisy score functions is well known as the Langevin dynamics sampling procedure. And it is also well known that Langevin dynamics can give us correct samples uh, as long as we keep this sampling procedure to be sufficiently long until convergence and as long as we set a sufficiently small step size. So now we know score matching can estimate a score function from data and Langevin dynamics can generate samples from this score function. So can we combine them together to generate new samples? Well, we can do this 
uh, in principle, but it does not work well in practice. So here, the left figure shows some existing images in the CIFAR 10 dataset. And the right figure in comparison shows the newly generated samples by combining formation and alignment dynamics directly. So clearly you can see that the newly generated samples do not look realistic at all. So clearly there is something wrong with this simple approach. And in fact, score matching and alignment dynamics have been around for decades, but people were stuck on this problem of generating convincing high quality images for a long time. So what could be the reason here? In our research, we have identified several issues. And one of the biggest challenge is the difficulty of esti estimating score functions in low data density regions. So for illustration purpose, let's consider a toy example. The left figure shows uh, the density function for a mixture of Gaussian distribution. The middle figure shows the ground truth score function of this mixture of Gaussian distribution. And the right figure shows the estimated score function by training a score model using score matching on samples from this mixture of Gaussian. So clearly the estimated scores are accurate in high data density regions, which are uh, given by these green boxes. In the low data density regions, unfortunately, you can see that the estimated scores are not accurate. And this is because we use score matching to estimate our scores. And this score matching objective only considers the difference between the data score and the model score averaged over samples from the data distribution. So in low data density regions, there are no existing uh, data samples and therefore not sufficient information to infer the true score function in those regions. And this means that when we use the estimated score function from score matching, large dynamics might have a lot of trouble exploring those low data density regions. To address this difficulty, we propose to inject the right amount of Gaussian noise to perturb our data set. So after doing this noise perturbation, we can perturb those data points to populate low data density regions to shrink the size of low data density regions. And this can greatly help score estimation in those low data density regions. So what does it mean to perturb our data points? Let's imagine our data set contains many images then using Gaussian noise to perturb them means we add independent Gaussian noise to perturb each pixel of the image to make them look noisy. So in this toy example, you can see that after injecting the right amount of Gaussian noise, the estimated scores are accurate almost everywhere. And this is a very encouraging observation. It says that those score functions of noisy distributions might provide faithful information to help large dynamics to move from low data density regions to high data density regions. But the cost is those noisy data distributions are no longer good approximations to the original true data density. So how to address this issue? In our research, the key insight is we can use a large number of different noise levels to jointly perturb our training data set. So as a toy example, let's suppose we consider three noise levels ranging from sigma one to sigma three. We can use Gaussian noise of mean zero and standard deviation from sigma one to sigma three to perturb our training data set. So this will give us three noisy training data sets. And for each noisy data set, there will be a corresponding noisy data distribution, which we denote as p sigma one to p sigma three. So in the context of images, this perturbation process will look like this. After Achieve, after obtaining those noisy data sets, the next step is to estimate the noisy score function for each of those noisy data distributions. So how can we estimate all those noisy score functions? One naive idea is we can train a large number of independent uh, score models to estimate the score function for each noise level. However, this is not scalable at all because in practice, we might need thousands of noise levels. So we cannot train so many different score models. In our research, we use a more scalable approach that is we only need to train a single noise conditional score model. So this noise conditional score model is just a score model, but it takes sigma, the input noise level, as one additional dimension of the input. The output of this conditional score model corresponds to the score function for the input noise level sigma. So how can we train our noise conditional score model? we use the following score matching objective. So this score matching loss function is a summation of different individual score matching losses 
where we have one scoring loss for each noise level sigma i, and we use a positive weighting function lambda sigma i to balance the scales of different scoring losses to help optimization. So this positive weighting function can be derived using principles of theoretical analysis, or it can be given using heuristics. So by minimizing this summation of scoring loss functions, we are simultaneously minimizing each individual scoring loss. And as long as our original, original loss noise conditional score model has enough capacity, we can train this conditional score model to be accurate for every noise level using this objective function. So after training, how do we generate new samples? Well, we can first apply Langevin dynamics to sample from the score model with the biggest noise level. So those samples will be used as initialization to sample from the next noise level and we can continue in this fashion until we sample from the score model with the smallest noise level. And those samples will be uh, reviewed as the final samples from our noise conditional score model. So this sampling approach is called annealed Langevin dynamics because the intuition is that we want to gradually anneal down the temperature of our noisy data distributions to generate samples. So how does this approach work in practice? This is the result when applying this method to several real image datasets. You can see that we start from a very noisy initialization. We gradually reduce the noise by modifying the images according to the noise conditional score model. And this can generate nice looking image samples much, much better than before. So the question is how good are those samples? We can compare with the previous best approach which was GANs. So GANs were known to be the best genetic model for sample generation for a long time, especially for image generation. And the Turing Award winner Lena Kuhn has said that GANs are the most interesting idea in the last 10 years in machine learning. And they have attracted a lot of attention from big universities and corporations. And people have spent so much time on improving GANs so that GANs can indeed generate very amazing image samples nowadays. The interesting thing is uh, with such a simple approach of score-based genetic modeling, we can actually outperform GANs in terms of image generation on CIFAR-10 dataset. So CIFAR-10 is a quite competitive uh, image generation benchmark. And this is the first time that a different type of genetic model can actually outperform GANs on this particular benchmark. And with better neural network architectures and the better score matching methods, we can actually further improve the performance of sample generation on c 10 So here are some existing images in the training partition of the dataset. So c 10 contains many small images, but this is a, a quite competitive benchmark. You can basically find the results on c 10 in a large majority of genetic modeling papers in the past few years. Those are newly generated samples from our score best models. So you can see that those samples look quite realistic and diverse. And they're also different from existing images in the training data set, which means you cannot generate such samples by simply memorizing our training data set. And quantitatively, we can compare with the previous best approach, which is Salgan 2 IDA. We achieved significantly lower FID scores and also higher inception scores. So those FID score and inception score, they are the most popular metrics for comparing the performance of a the different genetic models in terms of image generation. This says that score-based models can challenge the long-time dominance of GANs on image generation. And our approach is also scalable enough to be able to generate high fidelity, high resolution image samples. So here are two random image samples from our score-based model. They all have the resolution of 1024 by 1024. So here are more such images from the same score best model with the same resolution. So those images all look very realistic, although they, they are not state of that yet, they are already quite comparable to the best GAN method on this task. And the score best models not only allow us to generate nice looking samples, it can also control the generation process in a principled way. So suppose we have a genetic model that can generate images of dogs and cats, but we only want images of cats. And for this purpose, let's imagine we have a forward model and give us the image label Y for any image X. And we hope to provide a control signal, which is the target label Y here, and want to generate images of dogs only. 
So this amounts to finding the uh, probabilistic inversion to the forward model. And uh, this is the conditional distribution of X given the target label Y. And we call this the inverse distribution because it is basically uh, an inversion to our forward model. So how can we find this inverse distribution? The most standard approach is to use the Bayes rule. So in the Bayes rule, we know the prior distribution. This is the unconditional GNF model. We know the forward model, this can be a classifier in this particular example, but we don't know the denominator. So this denominator is just the normalizing constant for our inverse distribution. So again, we can leverage score functions to bypass this intractable normalizing constant. And this gives us the base rule for score functions. So this can be derived quite easily by taking the logarith logarithmic derivative on both sides of the base rule. So again, you can see that the term involving this intractable normalizing constant goes away. And the score function for the inverse distribution is just a summation of two terms, where the first term is the unconditional score function that can be estimated by training an unconditional score model. Second term is the gradient of the logarithm of the forward model. So uh, for a classifier, this gradient of logarithm can be easily computed. Some other applications, we can directly specify this forward model so this gradient of logarithm can also be easily computed. So what's nice about this formulation is that we can now plug in different forward models for exactly the same score model so that we can apply a single score model for different applications and test the time without model retraining. So here is one example of this idea. We can use this to convert stroke patterns to photorealistic images. Here, the forward model gives us a stroke pattern for any image. And we can train a score-based gen model on realistic images only without worrying about stroke patterns. And then we use this score-based model to invert our forward model to, co to convert stroke patterns into photorealistic images. And here is another result. This is excellent work done by other researchers. So here, the forward model is an image caption in your network that gives us the text description for any uh, input image, we can train a score-based model on images only without worrying about the text description at all. And then we can use this score model to invert this image company neural network to generate images conditioned on text. And here is another result. This is an application in medical image reconstruction. We consider the problem of computed tomography. So in this case, we use X-rays to project through human bodies. Those X-rays will pass through human flesh and, and hit the detector. So the detector gives us the sinogram and we hope to invert this detector observation sinogram to the original cross-sectional medical image. And in particular, we care about this task of sparse view computer tomography, meaning that our observation is sparse and we use as few uh, X-ray projections as possible to limit the radiation for patients. And in this case, the forward model gives us the sinogram for any medical image. So this is, uh, uh, can be always given using physical simulation, can be designed by hand. And we can use genetic models here. We train genetic models on typical medical images to provide prior knowledge. So this can help us reduce the requirement on the number of X-ray projections. And here is the result on some real CT data sets. We consider only 23 X-ray projections, while in contrast, people typically need hundreds to thousands of X-ray projections. So here is the result of a traditional compressed sensing algorithm. You can see that with only 23 projections, the image is quite blurry. And by the way, we use PSNR and SSI to quantify the performance of different results. So here are results that uses deep neural networks to directly map 23 projections into a medical image. And here is our result. This is a purely generative approach. And here is the ground truth. So you can see that both qualitatively and quantitatively, we can achieve better performance than competing deep learning methods. And this is actually the first time that a purely generative approach can outperform deep learning methods specifically designed for a particular number of projections. While as a purely generative approach, our method does not require the knowledge of this task during training. So we can easily adapt our model to different settings, such as different number of projections and test the time without model retraining. 
And people have observed a similar success on accelerated magnetic resonance imaging as well with score-based genetic models. So the research community has been quite excited about those line of progress in score-based genetic model. And people have reported new state-of-the-art results on many other tasks. This includes image generation on more challenging image data set like ImageNet. So here, all four images were generated from a score-based model and they have a higher quality than even the best kind of approach on this task. And similar success has been observed on audio synthesis, text-to-speech generation, material design, shape generation for 3D point clouds. And we have also observed the similar success on molecular confirmation prediction and on time series prediction. And some researchers from Oxford have also created a website called scorebestgenetmodeling.github.io, which includes a superset of those examples. So, so far, we have talked about how score-based genetic modeling allows flexible models and how we can generate uh, high-quality samples by directly sampling from those models with a controllable generation procedure. For the next part, I will focus on how we can compute probability values accurately with models of score functions. To compute prob probability values accurately, we will need to generalize the previous framework from using a finite number of uh, uh, iterations to using on the infinite number of noise levels. So to gain some intuition first, let's suppose our data distribution is a one-dimensional mixture of Gaussian distribution. And let's imagine we only have three noise levels from sigma one to sigma three. We can use Gaussian noise of mean zero and the standard deviation from sigma one to sigma three to perturb our training data set. And clearly, if we have sufficiently large Gaussian noise, we can convert any data distribution into a single Gaussian distribution. For each noisy distribution, we can use a one-dimensional heat map to represent its density. So with more noise levels, we have more heat maps. In the limit of infinite noise levels, we will have a continuous two-dimensional heat map. So here we use PT to represent each noisy data distribution, where T is a continuous parameter ranging between zero and capital T. So here the capital T is a fixed constant. When t is a zero, p zero is always the same as the data because no noise is added at this moment. When t is capital T, p capital T contains a lot of Gaussian noise and it will be close to a simple Gaussian distribution which we denote as pi x. So suppose we are given this infinite number of noise levels, how can we generate corresponding noisy data, distrib uh, noisy data sets for training our score model? Well, we use an idea of random of stochastic processes. So starting from the original data set, we can inject Gaussian noise smoothly to perturb our training data set. So the trajectories of those noisy images will form trajectories of stochastic processes. Recall that by the end of the perturbation, we obtain samples from this noisy data distribution P capital T, which is close to the simple Gaussian distribution pi x. So here, the so-called stochastic process is a collection of an infinite number of random variables. Uh, each random variable is indexed by the continuous parameter t. So for every random, random variable, there will be a corresponding probability density function. A stochastic process will then correspond to an infinite number of probability densities. If we find the right stochastic process, we can, we can then use this stochastic process to represent and the infinite number of noisy data distributions. So how to determine a stochastic process? We can solve a stochastic differential equation. So a, an SD has the following form. You know, F is called the deterministic drift function. This is uh, usually the same as what we would have in an ordinary differential equation. And we also have this uh, infinitesimal white noise term yeah, WT is called Brownian motion. You can view DWT as infinitesimal Gaussian noise. So for illustration purpose, I will only consider a simplified form for the SDE as given below. But our method can be applied to more general stochastic differential equations. So by finding the right stochastic differential equation, uh, so, uh, yeah, by finding the right stochastic differential equation, we may also generate new samples by reversing this stochastic differential equation. So the procedure will look like below. 
So we start from random noise. We gradually remove the noise by tracing the original stochastic processes backwards in time. So given any forward SDE, for example, with a form uh, shown below, we can always find the reverse SDE. And importantly, this reverse SDE uh, depends on the score function. So here, DWT is actually infinitesimal noise in the reverse time direction, but it is also a Brownian motion as long as uh, time decreases from capital T to zero. So uh, the entire framework will then look like this. We have an SDE to convert data to noise, and then we can reverse this SDE based on our score function to generate data from noise. The key question is how do we estimate this score function? We can use a time conditional score model, which depends on T instead of a, a sigma. But it is very similar to our original noise conditional score model. And we hope to optimize this time conditional score model to approximate the score function of our noisy data distributions. The training objective is quite simple. It's just basically a continuous generalization to what we had before for training our noise conditional score models. So here we have one score matching loss for every time step t. We have a positive weighting function lambda t to weight the scales of different score matching losses to help optimization. And here, lambda t is a, a, can be given using principled theoretical analysis, or it can be given using uh, empirical methods. So after training our time conditional score model, we can plug it into the reverse SDE. And then we can solve the reverse SDE with any numerical SDE method, um, any numerical SDE solver to generate samples uh, from noise. So this approach actually generally, generalizes a noise conditional score models to time conditional score models. This approach also unifies diffusion probabilistic models into the framework of score-based genetic models. Now you can view diffusion models and the score-based models both as different discretization to the reverse SDE. So why we want to talk about this SDE formulation because this allows us to compute probability values very easily. We know that given the SDE, we can convert any data distribution to the noise distribution to the Gaussian distribution. The critical observation is actually the same thing can be done using an associated ordinary differential equation. So the trajectories of the ODE and the SDE look quite different from each other, but they all represent the same set of noisy data distributions as given by the heat map in the background. And this ODE is a critical for computing our probability values accurately. So for, for, for an SD of the following form, we have shown that the ordinary differential equation can be given by the following formula. Here, it depends on the score function only. And again, we can estimate this score function by training a time-dependent score-based model. So after training this time-conditional score-based model, we can plug it into the formula for our ODE to obtain the form for our ordinary differential equation. And now starting from some random noise vectors from our Gaussian distribution, we can solve this ordinary differential equation backwards in time. And this can gradually convert our noise vectors into high quality samples from our score-based model. In the meanwhile, it also converts the original Gaussian distribution into a model distribution, which we denote as p theta. And, and now I will show you that we can compute the value of p theta very accurately. So this depends on the following formula. In this formula, we connect log p theta on any data point x naught with the log Gaussian distribution and a one-dimensional uh, integral that involves the trace of the Jacobian of our time conditional score based model. So this trace term can be computed in polynomial time. But if you want faster computation, you can always use random projections to form unbiased estimators of this term, just like what we did in Celeste score matching. This one dimensional integral can be computed using an ordinary differential equation solver quite accurately. So using, using this formula, we can compute the value of log p theta on any data point x naught very accurately. And here are some existing results on real world data sets. So we report results in negative log probability, which is better when lower. And the results are in the units of bits per dimension, meaning that what's the average number of bits for encoding each dimension of the data point if we use this probability distribution for lossless encoding, for lossless compression. 
And for images without any compression, it will be eight bits per dimension. So here are some existing results on to image datasets. And uh, you can see that all existing uh, results achieve bits per dimension that are lower than eight bits per dimension. So this indicates effective compression. And here is the result of our approach where we achieved 2.83 on CIFAR 10, which is quite close to the previous state of the art 2.8. We achieved the new state of, state of the art 3.76 on ImageNet as well. So this says that score-based genetic models can not only challenge the dominance of GANs on sample generation, but can also challenge years of dominance of autoregressive models and the variational autoencoders on achieving higher likelihoods on given data sets. So now as a conclusion, we have shown that score-based genetic models allows very flexible models they can generate a very high quality new data samples using a controllable generation procedure. And it can give us uh, anchored probability values with better empirical performance. So with that, I'd like to thank you for being here in my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, great. Great. Thank you for your presentation. Quite a lot of information information for us. So um, for the uh, people in the audience, so you can uh, ask questions uh, by raising your hand or by ty typing the question in the chat that uh, if you don't want to ask, don't want to ask uh, yourself or you want me to ask uh, on your behalf. Okay, so maybe I want to, uh, to uh, start uh, um, the first question. Okay, so um, mentioned that uh, you know uh, you know sampling from say the uh, the uh, data distribution can be very difficult for, for the dynamics of one right and uh, you know tampering has been like a long a long standing uh, technique I for example say dividing your, your energy with say T right so um, maybe can you expl explain about the difference between this uh, approach and and your your particular noise and perhaps talk about why why the sort of like the conventional tempering technique doesn't work. I see. So uh, you are saying that okay. we can also condition the energy-based models on noise by dividing by T, so using temperature to anneal the energy. Yes. Yeah. So basically, you have to have two certain kinds of annealing, right? One is adding noise. Yeah. Another is uh -huh. like uh, divided by temperature. That's the that's the temper. Maybe can you talk yeah. a little bit about the compression and then say say why it might not work? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, the major difference is uh, uh, when we anneal the data distribution by any noise, we can generate uh, noisy data sets quite easily. So we can get samples from that uh, anneal the data distribution. But if we use the temperature to anneal the data distribution, we cannot generate samples easily from them. And uh, that's the major difficulty. So the approach of annealing the energy with temperature is mostly useful when we have the energy itself already, but we don't have samples. So here the case is the opposite. We have samples, we don't have the ground truth data distribution. So we want to obtain samples from those annealed data distribution and any noise is the simplest way to do this. Okay, I so, think I see. I, I have another way, uh, another, uh, another problem is uh, temp tempering does not solve of uh this uh this uh it's not a very efficient way to solve the problem of of this connected mode. Uh huh. Okay. Uh yeah yeah. That, I think that's also a great point because uh yeah, any noise can actually connect different modes to get, but uh, changing the temperature may not always have this effect. Great. So there are some questions. In, some questions in the chat. Okay. So, uh, Sigfrid asks. How complicated is this whole, pi whole pipeline implement and use as compared with GAN or VAE? Yeah, so this pipeline is uh, definitely more complicated uh -huh. than GANs or VAEs. So because uh, the training is actually quite simple, but the sampling procedure requires implementation of uh, SDE solvers, so it requires implementation of long-term dynamics. So it's a little bit more difficult than VAEs or GANs, but uh, still uh, I feel it's manageable difficulty. And uh, uh, people are more, it seems easier for people to implement kinds of ways, uh, also partially because people are so familiar with those concepts. So uh, yeah, I feel with people who have the capability of implementing kinds of ways, it shouldn't be hard to implement this type of approach. Um, yeah, so that's my opinion. Okay, okay, so next question. So Margarita asks, could you talk about the weakness, weakness of the models as compared to GANs and VAEs? 
Yeah, so uh, compared to Gans and Waze, the biggest weakness is the uh, first, um, the sampling the sampling speed is uh, quite slow compared to those existing methods. So there are some uh, recent approach that tries to improve the sampling speed, but still it's not comparable to the sampling of GANs and VAEs. And that's one major difficulty. Another difficulty is uh, uh, there is no natural latent space with a lower dimensionality here in our case. So it will be harder to obtain disentangled representations or doing some manipulation in the latent space compared to GANs and VAEs. But still, we can actually have uh, a latent space similar to normalizing flow models using the ODE formulation. Uh, it's just this latent space will have the same dimensionality as the input space. So maybe it does not have that nice disentanglement. Okay, great. Okay, so um, uh, Zhe, uh, Zhe can you unmute if you want to ask the question since the uh, uh, diversity? Oh, hi. Hi, Yingzheng and Yang. Uh, could, you, could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first line is about sample quality. Uh, well, I, I have some experience in using diffusion models for speech waveform generation. Mm -hmm. Well, for speech waveform generation, now the SOTA models are GAN based vocoders. So the reason mm -hmm. is that they use a lot of discriminators to improve the sample quality. The discriminators mm -hmm. include the ones in time domain and time frequency domain. So, mm -hmm. for so for diffusion models, in the training stage, we have only L1 or L2 regression loss. So uh, although, mm. it's a, although the generation process is a progressive method, it is a very strong method. But I, mm. uh, but I think uh, in my uh, experiments, uh, I think the, from the waveform sample quality, I, think, I, I still think the gun-based vocoders are, are better. So, so could I ask, mm. is there any way to incorporate some adver adversarial, I mean, uh, auxiliary losses, such as adversarial loss into mm. the training of Diffusion models. Uh, I know. I know yeah. that one, one way uh, is that we can directly estimate the x zero from x t, uh, and mm. we can we, we can add uh, uh, the rest of the loss at uh, at the estimated x zero. So uh, do, do do you think uh, is there any other method to to improve the sample quality by by, by using some auxiliary losses losses or other method? Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, I think. There is a work by Alexia from Lila, and uh, she works on a uh, similar uh, project. So basically, you can incorporate out of serial, out of serial loss into the score matching loss as well. And uh, this can sometimes improve the sample quality. And you can also just combine the idea of diffusion with GANs. There is a work called Denoising Diffusion GANs. And basically, just uh, use GANs to, to do multiple denoise stage. And that's a combination of uh, score matching and out of a serial optimization as well. So a few of those cases, if you prefer GAN approaches, this, those, are, those methods might further improve the performance of GANs on this task. OK, 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 thank you. And uh, I have another question. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. well, yeah, go ahead. For, imp <laughs> yeah. for improving the sampling speed, many researchers have proposed methods to, uh, to change the, the distribution of the noise, the noise di distribution. So we can, we can give some prior for the noise distribution. For example, we can change the mean or the variance of the uh, Gaussian noise. So, yeah. uh, uh, but do you, think, do you think it's better to use a uh, noise that, uh, which is similar to data distribution? Uh, I mean, for example, we can, we, can use a, we, we can use a standard Gaussian distribution and we can also use a distribution which is very similar to data samples. Uh, but, I know, but I know that uh, this, this change will not, will not uh, will not bring any difference to the diffusion steps. We still, we still need, for example, 1,000 diffusion steps to guarantee, the, to guarantee we can transform the data distribution into our desired distribution. Uh, so, but, but, but do you think it's better to use a, a, a noise which is very similar to data samples or, or there is some trade-off between the, uh, it, uh, for example, one, one option is the data samples and uh, data distribution and the other option is the Gaussian distribution. Hmm. Yeah, so I think this is probably related to another question in the chat. So basically uh, choosing a different type of noise distribution, instead of using Gaussian, we can use some other distribution, maybe one with a heavy tail. So, um, so I actually think from a theoretical perspective, using a different type of noise other than Gaussian might not be optimal because uh, the reversion, the reversal 
uh, is only possible when you use Gaussian distribution. Otherwise, the reversal won't be exact. So uh, the special part about the Gaussian noise perturbation is uh, when we perturb the data distribution with uh, Gaussian, this means the reverse uh, process can also be viewed as a Gaussian perturbation process. So if you change the Gaussian to something else, maybe a gamma distribution, then the reverse uh, process may not be captured by injecting Gaussian noise or gamma noise. So that will complicate things a lot. So from a theoretical perspective, I feel it's probably not optimal to use a different type of noise other than Gaussian. So actually, even though uh, we only use Gaussian noise perturbations, it's, it's already quite flexible. So from the perspective of stochastic differential equations, uh, you know, SD is always use Brownian motion as part of the, the driving uh, stochastic process, and but they can already represent uh, very complicated types of noise, like in addition to Gaussian noise, but but also other things. If you uh, if you change the drift function to be nonlinear, then you can represent a lot of complicated things. Yeah, so I feel using a different type of noise might have some might have some improvement in practice, but from the theoretical perspective, um, I'm still a little bit uh, <laughs> doubtful about this approach. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, because in my experience, uh, in my experiment results, I find that it, it, it's not always a good choice to change the, the noise distribution type. I mean, sometimes we can achieve better sample quality, but sometimes we 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 can't. So, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. So uh, if there is any no other questions, maybe let me end with the, the usual questions that we want to, that we want to ask. So what do we are this exciting frontier, exciting frontier of research? Uh, yeah, so the, for future direction, I think uh, one thing is uh, how can we um, uh, how can we improve the sampling speed even further? So there are some existing results, but still it's much slower than GANs. Can we make them, make them as fast as GANs? This is one research question. Another research question is uh, how can we use uh, this line of approach for solving your post inverse problems? How can we control the generation of those methods? So uh, it's quite different from GANs and VAEs because there is no latent space, but uh, it has its own advantage. It can combine um, another component using the base true for score functions. So this might make it possible to solve many uh, difficult problems that GANs and VAEs cannot solve. Um, yeah, and also another question is uh, like theoretical understanding of why this line of approach can generate a higher quality samples compared to existing approaches, especially existing likelihood based approaches like VAEs or autoregressive models, why we can significantly outperform them. This is also something we don't quite understand from a theoretical perspective. Okay, okay, great. Thank you very much, Yang, yeah, for giving us this, this uh, great talk. So we learned quite a lot of uh, uh, from your talk. Okay, so thank everyone. Thank everyone for helping you enjoy this talk. Yeah, thank you very much.